Welcome, Dr. Roberta Hines, the chairman and professor at Yale University. Thank you for joining us today. I'm very thrilled to have this opportunity to talk to you. For those of us who may not know you very well, can you please give us a brief description about yourself? So thank you, Allison, and thank you for this wonderful opportunity. And I will keep this brief. Um, I've had the privilege of being chair at Yale for 27 years. Um, I started my career as a intensivist anesthesiologist and have spent most of my clinical life in that domain um, and really have used that as a, um, as a springboard for my research and my education um, and really have always been excited about uh, those unique opportunities to be able to, to have an interface between those really three traditional domains. And while I'm somewhat biased or some would say profoundly biased, I think that um, anesthesiology is unique in that situation where we do have the opportunity to extend our sphere uh, in clinical in those domains where, where so many of our colleagues have more limited opportunities uh, in terms of balancing their life, balancing their clinical and academic life. So, so I, like I said, I have been a, uh, at the chair for 26 to 27 years. I did my medical school at Dartmouth um, in a time when medical school was three years. So we could have an interesting talk about that. Everything old is new again, right? We're revisiting visiting medical school, we really need to train everyone for four years. Um, so I've had, I've had lots of interesting and some would say non-linear and non-traditional opportunities in my career. Um, and I do believe I've been advantaged by all of them. That's fantastic. And yes, what is old becomes new and what new becomes old again. <laughs> So as a young attending, when you first started out, what was your intended career path? I'm not sure I was I was clairvoyant enough to have a real path. It was probably more like a sinusoidal wave. It wasn't linear for sure. Um, it was clearly one that was going to allow me to do what we just talked about, which was um, I am not content to do one thing all the time. And so for me, it was having the opportunity to really be a superb clinician also um, have a real strong impact in trainees, which has always been a passion and continues to be a passion of mine, um, and think about how all of that would inform research. Because I think our research is most impactful when it's been informed by our patients and those that we serve. Um, and so for me, it was finding the sort of uh, intersection of all of those domains. Um, and I think without actually ever really being able to articulate it, there was a big piece of of mentoring uh, that was in there. I, I was always excited when um, I could mentor someone and traditionally it tended to be nurses in the ICU, um, but it I was agnostic to who we could mentor at that point in time and mentoring was just really important to me. Mm -hmm. That's um, fantastic. And um, did you initially think you would hold a leadership position or did you just think you would focus on um, research and more clinical uh, work? I honestly never asked myself that question. I, it happened organically. And I think you've got a sense of a lot of things that happen really do happen as a, as more organic. Um, we can't, we can, we can certainly prepare ourselves with the requisite skill, skill set for when things present uh, to us, it's often much harder to have a defined role and say, I'm absolutely going to prepare myself for that role. And so for me, it was sort of being in the ICU at a time when I just finished my cardiac and ICU fellowships, and we opened one of the first dedicated cardiothoracic ICUs in the country that was around 1982. And um, because of the unique opportunity that I had both cardiac anesthesia and ICU training, um, our cardiac surgeons actually approached us. Would we, which is also sort of interesting, right, and speaks to opportunity in unusual places. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I think, is really important talks about relationship building. Um, if you think about 1982 or 1983, when this happened, it wasn't a time when surgeons often thought of um, 
anesthesiology outside of the operating room. So when I when I tell this story, I use it really to think about how broad our presence could be and should be, and how it advantages us in the entire house of medicine. Because as I said, they came to ask us to lead the CTICU. We didn't go knocking on their door. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right, and that's, um, you highlight something that's really important. Um, And that I've heard actually several times from other people is that um, opportunities that present themselves and uh, you have to, um, you know, when you find that opportunity, take it and, and, and go with it. Um, And, and usually it brings, brings more um, importance to you and the, and the, and the community at large. And I think in general, we as women tend to be a bit more risk averse um, than our male colleagues. And I think it is important to stress it for this audience in particular. We tend to overanalyze, overcognate, um, you know, and, and that, that sometimes prevents us from taking that leap when we ought to. And as long as you're internally feeling you're prepared, you know, don't listen to those inner negative voices. Mm-hmm. Yes, that is very true. Very true. For those young researchers who are trying to find their focus, how how do you suggest they go about it? It's really important to have a passion. Um, You're going to hear that from me in a lot of domains because, you know, we work really hard. Um, When the clock goes off at four o'clock in the morning, you really want to be get out of that bed, right? (laughs) And so it's really having a passion and a sense of fulfillment for what you do. So... find something that that does that for you, right? Whether it's clinical research, whether it's translational or basic, for me, it's really all about, about, as we talked about before, advancing clinical care. I would see things in the ICU um, and be saddened that we were not able to change the course of patient care um, and see how, you know, seeing how much we'd accomplished, but how much more there was to accomplish. And it was those really clinic, for me, my research has always been in the clinical domain has really been those clinically focused questions. And it is important to listen because some of the best ideas I ever have gotten have from people who haven't been um, shy to ask why, why don't you do this? Or why do we do this? Equally important, right? Mm -hmm. And keep an, and, and particularly in the ICU, the interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary nature of what we do is so impactful in research. And that's something also I would like everyone to you know think about when you're developing a research career. Um, many of the questions that led me to, to my clinical trials didn't come from my anesthesia colleagues. They came from pharmacists. They came from um, you know nutritionists who are making rounds with me in the ICU. So keep an open mind as well as open ears when people ask those questions because they're often going to challenge you to think about the question differently and often better than you would have coming from your own specific domain. Yeah, that's so important. And um, you highlight something again that um, you you learn from others uh, and not necessarily other anesthesiologists, other team members. And um, they do sometimes help you uh, further define your, your question or, um, or even come up with a whole new idea. So yeah, that's really, um, important to think about when you're trying to figure out what's my hypothesis going to (laughs) be. And also families, you know, in the ICU, we have the, we have the luxury, and I do think it's a luxury uh, to be able to talk to patients and their families in a way we don't always get to do outside of the ICU. Um, And uh, it's really intriguing and interesting. Sometimes the most innocent question from a family member leads you to really think and question in a way that you might not have otherwise done so. Mm -hmm. Academic time, grants, and resources are all very scarce. How do I do my clinical work, but also find the time to do my research or or other academic endeavors? This is where being honest with yourself is incredibly important. Um, And I'm, I'm a big fan of making timelines. 
um, we all think we're going to accomplish at least 30% more at any given time than we do. And that's probably, a, you know, an underestimation, right? We're all kind of type A's and we all think we can make the 24 hour day, 28 hours. Um, so I, I, it's so important to be honest with yourself and prioritize in your, with yourself. What may be important in year one is going to be different than year two. And that leads to some other issues we'll talk about, which is mentorship, because that's where a mentor can be and should be profoundly impactful, is really um, doing a bit of reality testing and challenging you in the most thoughtful way, but really asking you, are your priorities what you really want or are your priorities being you know, imposed on you by somebody else? Um, and I think that's also really hard. Sometimes we try to please other people, um, particularly in the academic world, as opposed to thinking what's the right thing for ourselves and, and what is the right timing for ourselves. So timelines are exquisitely important. Use them with your mentor, check in, and, and don't beat yourself up when you don't meet one because we're all, we're all gonna to miss a timeline every now and then, um, you know, just kind of sit back and say, why didn't I do that? Was I too aggressive? Was I, you know, what, what didn't allow me to do that and, and allow some mid course corrections. So I think that's really important whether, you know, and I also think that we all, there's not a one size fits all, you know, we, we all have many domains to be successful in. And, and I'm very encouraged by new promotion processes now that have become much more open and recognize and reward things that were not rewarded or recognized. And that's important too, to really get a thorough understanding of your particular institution. What are the promotional paths? Because once you know that, then you can really develop an informed personal timeline to that and know what the benchmarks are. And they're not going to be the same at Yale as they are at Hopkins or they are at every. And so don't that it's really worth the investment of your time to sit and understand what they are as you chart that path forward. Mm -hmm. Um, you make so many important points in this, <laughs> in this one answer. Um, what are your thoughts on the current systems of academic promotion as it pertains to women and underrepresented groups in academic? Um, the good news is it's a process and evolution. Um, the answer I give you today is much more positive and forward thinking than what I would have given you certainly, you know, two or three years ago. And that is that we are thinking that it's not a one, it's not a linear way. Not, not, not everyone is going to be in this track or that track. We're really hoping to develop tracks that reward and, and get it entice people to be successful in every areas. I also think it's important to allow people to have life experiences, right? As I always say, life happens. Happens, no matter how planful we are. And at different points in your life, life life's events change you and challenge you. Um, you know, when you're earlier, it may be child rearing, it may be other issues, it may be as one advances, you know, illnesses in your family or taking care of aging parents. So there's not certainly a one size fits all in terms of what we should reference in terms of those abilities. But I also think it's incredibly impactful and important that at least many Many of the promotion uh, aspects that I know about do allow folks to take a little bit of time, um, up to six months for child rearing, up to six months for FMLA for an aging parent or an aging um, partner. Those are things which, and I think it's important, and I want to um, make a plug, if I can, for people to really get invested in those promotional issues. Sit in a promotions committee. It's a lot of work, um, but anything that, you know, most, most things, anything worth doing is really going to give you a reward, as my grandmother would say. Um, and I've learned so much as a junior faculty sitting on promotion committees um, at the department level. And then as I've gotten more senior sitting on university committees, because you do really get a sense of what propels people and also what has stopped people from moving forward. And that has been impactful in terms of many of the policies we have here around abilities for people to take time to address what's important in their personal life and not move backwards in the, in the promotion cycle. So I think many times people think there's not an academic value was sitting on a promotion committee, but that's absolutely not, not at all true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, I think I agree with you and, and a lot of aspects because A, I think um, 
it's nice to see uh, institutions changing their pr clinical promotions, you know, make creating clinical promotions that are more uh, generalized for other in academic endeavors that were not credited before. And then also, um, you just mentioned the sitting on committees. And I think this is something even that I didn't recognize. And now that I'm learning and, and um, talking to other people, I recognize that participating in these committees in your hospital or in your department are helpful, not only um, because you learn about this certain area that you would never have been exposed to, but also that's how you start developing networks. And I didn't recognize in the past how important these networks are for your future. And um, so that's another thing that I've learned from participating and also from talking to all of the women here. I think it's, it's extra or, or even more important in anesthesiology because we're often seen as being bound by the walls of the OR. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we're not always as when people think about, you know, will we contribute to the ethics committee or should we be called to sit on the ethics committee? I mean, certainly if it's anything around periop, right? They're the first, we're the first group they run to. But when, when we're thinking about non-traditional roles in that space, you know, it takes one or two people to really open the doors. And the other thing I, is important to stress is that not only is it important to get on a committee, but it's really, really important to show up and contribute. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, more important because nothing will move us backwards than to, you know, get put somebody on a committee, and then that person doesn't, sh doesn't show up, doesn't contribute. And then the next person we nominate for that committee, there's always going to be this question mark. So getting there is really only half the battle. It's really, you know, making sure you are, one is prepared, you're contributing, and that you continue to give, give that seat to somebody else as you move forward. Uh, yes, that is true too, because um, I've, we, I've seen that too. I've seen that happen as well, um, even at my own institution. Um, so yeah, it, it is important. And also, again, that helps you showcase what you can do and, um, and then people think of you. Again, thank you I've so seen, much. You've been wonderful. It's been fabulous talking to you. you. You're such an inspiration.